what is identity? What does it mean to say that this thing and this thing are identical? Let's find out. Hello everyone, welcome back to Attic Philosophy. This is a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. In this video, we're going to be talking about identity in logic and specifically the use of identity in first order logic. We're going to see how to express it, how to give it meaning, what the semantics are, and how to use identity statements to express quantities, like there's at least two happy people watching this video right now. Actually, I hope there's more than that. If you're finding this series of videos on logic useful, why not subscribe to the channel, get the updates. I'm going to be releasing plenty more videos on logic over the next few weeks. Now, identity is a huge topic in philosophy and logic, and there's actually different senses of identity that we could look at. So if you think about identity as it crops up in the equal sign in maths, for instance, versus identity when we're talking about identity politics, these are these are really quite distinct senses of identity. And we have to be clear about which we mean. Now, we're going to be looking at numerical or quantitative identity. So whenever we're talking about identity in logic, we're talking about numerical identity, meaning this thing is the same thing as this thing. A is the same thing, the same person or whatever as B. In this sense, it's called numerical identity because it relates to how many of something there are. OK, so if we're thinking about how many students are there in the class or how many people are watching this video right now. So there we're talking about the number of students, the number of people, how many there are. That's the sense of identity that we're talking about. Now, there are going to be some interrelationships between this notion of numerical identity and, for instance, identity politics. Because if we're talking about, for instance, how many women there are in the class, well, that's going to depend on who identifies as a woman. OK, so there are going to be links, but we're more or less going to push that to one side and look at logical, philosophical details of identity. So we are going to write identity like this, with this identity symbol, like equality, like you would have seen in mathematics. And we're going to read it as A is the same thing as B, or A is identical to B. So there is something of a puzzle of identity. How should we understand this kind of sentence in general? Is it telling us that two things, A and B, are identical? No, 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 no. We always want to avoid saying that two things are identical because two things are never identical. Not in the sense of numerical identity, OK? Because if they were identical, they would be one thing, not two things, OK? Two things are never identical. Everything is self-identical. Everything is identical to itself. I'm identical to me. You're identical to you and so on. No two things are ever identical to one another because if they were, they would be one thing, not two things. This is part of the puzzle, the philosophical puzzle of identity. What is identity telling us? What is an identity statement telling us? Is it a relation between things? How can it be if identity never applies to two things? OK, if two things can never be identical, then identity never relates things. Now, we know that everything is self-identical, so identity relates everything to itself. But it's kind of weird to say that we have this genuine relation that only ever relates one thing to itself and to nothing else. I mean, that's a bit weird. So maybe identity statements are telling us something different. Maybe they're trying to tell us something about the names involved. OK, so A equals B. Maybe that means something like the name A picks out the same thing as the name B. Well, that's true. If A equals B, if A is identical to B, then those names will be picking out the same thing. But that doesn't really seem to be what identity is about, because not all things have names. There are things that are identical. In fact, everything, because everything's self-identical, but that don't have names. There might be planets out there way on the far side of the universe. We've never given them a name. Maybe no one's given them a name. They're self-identical. They bear the identity relationship to themselves. So there we seem to be talking about identity 
independently of any names. OK, so identity isn't just telling us something about names, it's telling us something about things. But whether it's telling us anything, whether it's telling us anything informative, that's actually a pretty deep philosophical question. So there are lots of deep philosophical questions that we can ask about identity. Luckily, for the time being, we're going to ignore most of those and we're going to focus on identity as it crops up in first order logic. So first of all, we have to think about how we add identity to our language. That's actually really simple. We're going to add this predicate. So rather than writing it before names like we would with being happy or being married to, we're going to write identity sentences like this. It's a pretty familiar way writing it in between two names, or we could write it in between names and variables or two variables. They're all well-formed sentences. They are atomic sentences. OK, so this kind of sentence has no connectives in it. It's got the same syntactic form as something like R-A-B. It's an atomic sentence. We're also going to see sentences like this, and this is going to abbreviate A is not identical to B. A is not identical to B. So if we were writing that out longhand, we would write A is identical to B, and then we would negate it, just putting a negation symbol in front of it. We're abbreviating that like that, but we've got to be careful here. This is not a new symbol, okay? It's just an abbreviation of this. So this isn't an atomic sentence. It's an atomic sentence with a negation symbol in front of it, just written a different way. So that's an atomic sentence. That's not. It's got a connective in it. How should we do semantics for identity in first order logic? OK, so we've already got semantics for relations, for predicates. We think about them in terms of ordered pairs. So what we could do is we could look at the identity symbol and we could say, let's interpret that as a set of ordered pairs. And it would be the set of ordered pairs containing everything related to itself, because everything's identical to itself and not to anything else. But as it happens, we don't do it like that. Identity in first order logic is interpreted in a special way and, in fact, in a much more simple way. We just say that this sentence, A is identical to B, that's true relative to a model, just in case whatever that model interprets A as is the same thing as what it interprets B as. Some people think that this semantic clause here is kind of cheating because I've got the identity symbol there and I've also got it there. It's not cheating, but we just have to be a bit careful about what this means. This is a sentence of our logical language. So this is the identity predicate as it crops up in the logical language. This here is me saying that two things are the same thing. So this is the identity symbol in English. I could have written this out as the interpretation of A is the same thing as the interpretation of B. So this is a bit of English shorthand, whereas this is a sentence of our logical language. That's why it's not a circular definition. Identity is an equivalence relation. If you're not sure what an equivalence relation is, go back to the previous video on first order logic it's explained there. Identity is an equivalence relation because it's reflexive. Everything is identical to itself. It's symmetrical. If X and Y are the same thing, then Y and X are the same thing. And it's transitive. If X and Y are the same thing and Y and Z are the same thing, then X and Z are the same thing. So identity is reflexive, symmetrical and transitive. So it's an equivalence relation. In fact, it's the smallest equivalence relation. An equivalence relation puts things into equivalence classes. So a relationship like lives in the same city as or is the same height as groups people depending on which city they live in or how tall they are. And there might be lots of people in those clusters. OK, so uh, in the cluster that I'm in, the, the living in Nottingham cluster, there's something like 350,000 people. Identity by contrast, has the smallest possible clusters. There's exactly one thing in each cluster because for each thing, there's exactly one thing that's identical to it. And that's that very same thing. So every single thing that exists forms an equivalence cluster, a partition, all of its own. One really important principle concerning identity that crops up loads in both philosophy and logic is Leibniz's law. And it's also called the indiscernibility of identicals. And the idea there is that if 
A and B are the same thing, then any property that A's got, B has got, and vice versa. They are indiscernible, okay? Because there's no way you can tell them apart. There's nothing that you could say about A that you couldn't say about B and vice versa. So in logical terms, this statement of identity, A is B, will entail equivalences or biconditionals between A and B. So if A is F, B is F and vice versa. And that generalizes to any sentence. So we could express Leibniz's law like this. If A is the same thing as B, then for any sentence A, replacing the names A with B won't make any difference. So this sentence is going to be equivalent to the same sentence with all the A's replaced by B's. That's what this thing means. Replace all the names A with B. And they will be equivalent whenever A is the same thing as B. You might also hear of the converse of this principle, the identity of indiscernibles. Now that's a different principle, okay? That says that if a and B have all the same properties, then they're going to be identical. Depending on exactly what we mean by a property, if we think of the properties as just being the things we express with primitive one-place predicates, it won't be valid. It might be that A and B have all the same properties, like being happy, being five foot tall, and yet they're different things. Identity of indiscernibles is typically a controversial principle, but the one that we're interested in the indiscernibility of identicals, or Leibniz's law, is valid in logic. And it's a really important substitution principle because it allows us, whenever A and B are identical, to substitute A for B. That's going to be important when we come on to look at proofs because that will allow us, given some information like this in a proof, to transform any sentence with a name A in it into a sentence with a name B in it. OK, so there we have identity in first order logic. We've seen how to include it in the language. We've seen how to give semantics for. That is all for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've subscribed to the channel already, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you're enjoying these videos, but you've got questions, leave me a comment down below. OK, I'll see you next time.